Jim Bumgarner. Thanks. Laptop, please. Uh, do y'all like my shirt? Yeah. Let's have a nice Che. Yeah? Okay. All right. I think my laptop's uh, gone to sleep. Let's see if I can wake it up here. There we go. Um, uh, basically, I have brought you a little bit of the music of the spheres, and I'll get to that. But before I get to that, I wanted to talk about something that is pretty much completely useless, which is the screensaver. Because, come on, be honest. Do you really run those things to save your screen? I know I don't. Now, I have been making screensavers and screensaver-like things for a very long time. In fact, I've been making them since before I ever heard the word screensaver. I think I heard it maybe in 89, 90, around there. I think that's when it entered uh, common usage. And uh, so what I used to call things like this were just, you know, uh, programming. And this was how I learned programming, was by making little programs like this. Now, when I started programming, um, I had this idea that um, I could find the perfect program. The perfect program was kind of like the holy grail. What was the perfect program? I think other programmers I've talked to have experienced this. It's, this. it's this idea that you could make a really small program, maybe accidentally stumble upon it, and that program would do everything you could possibly want. It could make any picture you'd want. It would become intelligent. And so I kept trying to find it, and I've never found it. But along the way, while trying to find it, I keep stumbling upon these also rands. So I'm going to show you a few nearly perfect programs. They're kind of tributes to the perfect program I never found. So come with me now, back to those thrilling days of yesteryear, circa 1982, when I first started programming. And I used to make stuff like this, OK? The random pixel program. The random pixel program, uh, for the nerds in the audience, I'll show you the source code. OK, there it is. All right. It's a very short program. Now, the rest of you, that looks really complicated, right? But it's actually really, really short. All it basically says is, Take a random pixel, color it a random color, any color you like, repeat. That's it, OK? So this is almost like a perfect program. Because think about this. This is like that room full of uh, monkeys on typewriters. Anything could appear in here. I mean, right now, maybe the Mona Lisa. <laughs> you guys don't have enough faith. OK, OK. <laughs> Leaning Tower of Pisa. OK. Anything Italian. OK, so you don't have faith. Now, I'm guessing some of you are looking at this, and you're going, yeah, whatever. It's, it's, it's all the same. And that's an interesting thing that happens when you look at something with a lot of randomness in it. And uh, Claude Shannon has a lot to tell us about that. Claude Shannon is the guy that came up with information theory in a classic paper, The Mathematical Theory of Communication. So what did Shannon say? He basically said that randomness, which he didn't call randomness, he called it entropy. He said that entropy is basically what information is. It's how we measure information. And he said that the amount of entropy or novelty or randomness in a stream of information um, basically says how big it is, how big the pipes are that you need to carry it. And he says there's limits to how much information you can carry. If this picture were all one solid color, I could send it to you know, uh, your little cell phone with a really horrible wireless connection really quickly, because there's really no information in there. But if it was all random like this, I wouldn't be able to compress it at all, and, it and it's much bigger. Now, the interesting thing about Shannon's theory is that it also applies to your brain and the way you perceive stuff. There are limits to what you can perceive. In fact, you may have difficulty right now even listening to me because there's all these moving pixels behind my head. <laughs> so what do we do in order to make things more understandable? We reduce the amount of novelty in the content. We can only handle so much novel content. So one of the first things I did back in 1982 was this. It's a very simple modification to the program that creates symmetry by repeating the, pix the pixels in symmetrical positions. And this is still pretty hard to look at, but it's a little more interesting. Now, the, uh, the poster child for this process, for this balance between um, randomness and symmetry, is the kaleidoscope. And 
Um, because of my interest in information theory, I got obsessed with kaleidoscopes about five years ago, and I've made literally hundreds of kaleidoscope simulations. This is one of them here. Kaleidoscopes are very cool, because what's happening with a kaleidoscope? You're looking at something which is ultimately random, maybe chips of colored glass or confetti. In this case, what we're actually looking at is the original screensaver I showed you uh, back on my first slide. But we're only looking at a little piece of it, OK? In fact, we're looking at about half that wedge. And it's being repeated around. So what the symmetry is doing is it's reducing the amount of information I'm giving you. And that does something very important. It renders the unknowable a little more knowable. Now, I have a friend, Don Doak, who makes kaleidoscopes for a living. He's um, uh, very good at it. And he's been making them uh, for a long time, much longer than I've been programming. And he said to me that there's a secret to a good kaleidoscope. He said, a good kaleidoscope makes you feel as if you could almost understand what's happening, but not quite. It's just out of reach. So when I say that there are limits to what you can understand, I'm saying it's a good thing. When those limits exist, and when we get very close to them, but just outside, that's when something really interesting happens. Hold on, I'm going to look at my kaleidoscope a second here. All right. Now, since that time, I've been, I've been interested in, in randomness itself. And I've been interested in trying to find things that create equivalent complexity to the things that uh, a random number generator does on a PC, um, but that aren't necessarily random in that way. Because I've come to, to, to think or to suspect that randomness is just a point of view. Randomness is complexity we don't understand. There's a famous quote most of you have heard, Arthur C. Clarke. He said, uh, any sufficient technology is indistinguishable from magic. So I would say that any uh, sufficient complexity or complex system is indistinguishable from random. So basically, it's random if we can't really get our heads around it. And that means there will always be things that are random, because there are limits to what we can understand. So this is an example of one of those systems. This system has a great deal of complexity to it, but at the same time, there's no randomness to it whatsoever. In this system, these circles are spinning, and each circle is spinning at a constant rate. There's no unpredictability to this whatsoever. Now, what's happening in this system is that each circle, they've been drawn in a spiral formation, a Fibonacci spiral. Each circle is spinning slightly slower than the one before it. Now, this system of doing motion graphics uh, was explored extensively by a guy named John Wick.